so 110408, extraordinarily important number. An inspiring number, it is a number that brings images like this to mind, November 4th, 2008. The election that brought Barack Obama to office and led many people to think that we had won something. 365 electoral votes, 257 new Democrats or Democrats in the House, and eventually 60 senators led people to think that the victory would get us some form of reform. And of course, that campaign had an extraordinary range of aspirations to it. The aspirations were not tiny. Indeed, in the middle of the campaign, I had uh, received this angry email because I had criticized the campaign a bit about exactly what the campaign was about. As they said, we are running on a platform of universal health care, ending the Iraq war, a massive cap and trade system, $18 billion in new money for education, a revamping of the tax code to make it more progressive, a restoration of our civil liberties and enforcement of our anti-discrimination laws, a doubling of foreign aid, a huge expansion of national service tied to making college more affordable, tightening regulation of the financial markets, an unprecedented set of ethics, and this is why I knew it was authentic. They misspelled transparency. Rules governing the White House. Extraordinary, right? But at that time, it was totally possible. Anything seemed possible in a moment captured by an image like this. But if you look at this image, it actually has these three images. This is the image I was always focusing on, but noticing there are, notice there are other characters here. There's this guy, kind of worried, skeptical, as he's watching Barack Obama tell us about the future. This woman, a little bit wary, skeptical. This guy, completely depressed and not at all hopeful here, right? This image had all three of these people and this fourth skeptic in it. And 521 days into this administration, as we see this extraordinary plan stalled, I think we've seen a nation that has moved through each of these four faces. And people are wondering whether this transformational president is instead going to be an ordinary president. Astonishing to think this man, just an ordinary president, when he inspired this as the picture of his campaign. Now, why? What happened? What made this change into a question? I think the most important problem here is that we get people to focus on the right issue and to ignore the distractions. The right issue here, the only issue here, that we should be focusing everybody, regardless of your political persuasion, is on a democracy that has stalled. A democracy for the left and the right that has stalled. This simple mechanism, the idea that you vote, and if you win, you get what you voted for, that simple mechanism is broken in America. For the left and for the right, it is broken in America. Why? Well, here we can learn something, I think, from the framers of our democracy. If you look at their constitution, use your favorite search tool, you'll find out that the word democracy doesn't actually exist in our constitution. The framers were seeking a republic, but what they meant by a republic was a representative democracy, which we now think of as democracy. But their conception of democracy had a very simple relationship at its core. Democracy was a system where there was a certain dependency. Congress was to be dependent upon the people. The image of a system where the Congress knew its master and its master was the people, was the right dependency that produced independence. That's what congressional governmental independence meant. And they worked hard to avoid the wrong kind of dependencies. So the Constitution explicitly forbids any officer from receiving an emolument, office, title of any kind, whatever, from any king, prince, or foreign state without the permission of Congress. But also, 
They thought about the way courts could become dependent upon the executive. So they gave life tenure to judges to give them independence. They thought about the way the executive could become dependent upon the legislature, so they gave the executive the veto power, so it could be independent. They thought about the way legislators could become dependent upon the executive, so they created the emoluments clause that forbids a legislator from becoming an officer in the executive branch, at least during the term during which he or she was elected. In all of these cases, the objective was to create independence by creating the proper dependence. And the proper dependence for Congress was upon the people. So, is our Congress dependent upon the people? You could say technically it is. Every two years, Congress comes up to vote. After the 17th Amendment, every six years, senators come up to vote. So technically, voting controls them, but effectively or meaningfully is Congress dependent upon the people. Well, consider two things here, thing one and thing two. So the first thing, on the one hand, because of a practice born in Massachusetts called the Jerry Mander, there it is, the gerrymander in Massachusetts, we've created a practice of Congress building safe seats in Congress through an elaborate system to craft districts to guarantee that the member will come back if the member wants to come back. So here's a seat in Congress. Here's a seat in Congress. This is my favorite. This is in Illinois. You might think that Districts have to be connected. Fear not, this district is connected by Route 294. So if you're door by door, going door to door, you can go from Stone Park down the highway to get to Cicero in this particular district. And this strategy of gerrymandering to create safe seats has been successful. The one thing Congress has succeeded at is guaranteeing that their members can return to Congress if they choose an almost perfect re-election rate for those who choose to come back to Congress. But on the other hand, thing two here is that even though the seats are more safe, Congress has become more competitive. Since 1994, when the Republicans first demonstrated they could oust the Democrats, there has been an explosion of extraordinary competition to control how the House and Senate are controlled. A competition that manifests itself in fundraising. An explosion in fundraising, changing Congress's first job into the second job as they spend an increasingly large percentage of their time just raising money to get back to Congress. The Congress has become the fundraising Congress. Now, the point is, this is something new. As Robert Kaiser describes in his extraordinary book, So Damn Much Money, this is a new industry produced by the rise of a certain kind of lobbying practice. It's an economy. It has certain elements. There's the lobbyists, there are members, and there are interests that these members are affecting. Each of these pays the other. Each depends upon the other. So the lobbyists pay the members, both during and after their time in Congress. During their time in Congress, lobbyists pay with cash. And I don't mean the cash of brown paper bags. I mean the cash to support the campaigns through fundraising that the candidates need to get back to Congress. Candidates spend between 30 and 70% of their time raising money to get back to Congress. And so members become increasingly dependent upon these lobbyists as suppliers, or to push the metaphor just a bit, lobbyists as pushers. Now, this is new. As Kaiser puts it, money has been part of the American politics forever. On occasion in the Gilded Age or the Harding administration, for example, much more blatantly than recently. But the scale of it has just gotten way out of hand. The money may have come in brown paper bags in earlier eras, but the politicians needed and took much less of it than they take through more formal channels today. 
So compare this man, Max Baucus, senator from Montana, representing 0.3% of the American population. But he was arguably the most powerful man in the United States Senate affecting health care. And when he was the most powerful man, he happily opened up his campaign coffers to contributions by the very interests he would re regulate. More than $4 million he raised from the healthcare industry and insurance industry during the time that he held this power. Compare him with this man, John Stennis. Senator from Mississippi, no choir boy himself, John Stennis, but when he was head of the Armed Services Committee in the early 1980s, a colleague asked him to run a fundraiser to raise money from defense contractors. And Stennis replied, would that be proper? I hold life and death over these companies. I don't think it would be proper for me to take money from them. And the point that Kaiser makes is that this ethic is nowhere present in Washington today, as Washington has reversed the ethic and everyone in power expects they will leverage their power to raise funds for their campaign. And then after a member's tenure in Congress, the member gets paid by the lobbyists. They pay them with their future. So as my friend Jim Cooper describes, Congress is increasingly a farm league for K Street. Members and staffers and bureaucrats have an increasingly common business model here, one focused on life after government, life as lobbyists. So public uh, citizen estimated that between 1998 and 2004, 50% of United States senators left the Senate to become lobbyists, 42% of members of the House. And that means that increasingly everyone depends upon this system surviving. And in this sense, after their tenure, they get paid by lobbyists in Congress. And then the members pay the interests through policy that gets changed sometimes profitably. So this study from the University of Kansas of the job, American Jobs Creation Act showed that the return on investment from lobbying dollars spent was 22,000%. For every dollar spent, there was this return because of the change in the regulation this law affected. And then this recent paper in the American Journal of Political Science estimates that for large companies spending lobbying dollars to lower their tax rates, for every $1 spent, tax rates are lowered by between $6 and $20. Thus an obviously high return that explains why increasing number of firms are spending more and more money in Washington here. And then sometimes brazenly. So the New York Times had this story in the beginning of February about Charles Schumer going back to Wall Street to raise money for his campaign and for the Democrats. But he met a, had a chilly reception, as the paper put it. The city's titans of finance at a recent closed door meeting accused him of being insufficiently pro-Wall Street. One indignant fellow stood up and demanded his donation back. And of course, the effect of that attitude by funders on Wall Street is to have a significant effect on policy. So there was a recent article just last week in the New York Times about the top 100 incomes from hedge fund uh, uh, traders. The average income from the top on the top 10 traders was 2.5 billion dollars, right? Billion with a B. That was their income last year. Now they are subject to a tax on that income, but unlike you and me. The tax that they make on that income is capital gains tax, not ordinary income tax. So the maximum rate for them on their $2.5 billion in income is just 15%. Barack Obama wanted to change that. He thought that loophole should be closed, that they should at least pay ordinary tax rates on this $2.5 billion in income. But Congress said no, many leaders believing that if they took away that tax benefit, they people who were receiving the benefit would take too much money away from contributions to members to Congress. So members benefit these interests. And then the interests benefit the lobbyists. As Kaiser puts it, in earlier generations, enterprising young men came to Washington looking for power and political adventure, often with ambitions to save or reform the country or the world. In the last fourth of the 20th century, such aspirations were supplanted by another familiar 
American yearning to get rich. This is a industry about the size of the American recording industry. This man who invented the way earmarks are used has amassed more than $100 million in wealth from this industry. And as the industry has become wealthy, Washington has become wealthy. Now having seven of the richest counties surrounding Washington, D.C., as increasingly people recognize the business of selling policy is an extraordinarily profitable business. The point is, we have to think of these things together as an economy that produces its own dependency, a dependency that increasingly displaces the dependency the framers imagined. No longer are the people at the core of this dependency, but the funders. That's the Fundraising Congress. Now, the Fundraising Congress is bad for Congress first. It's bad for America, too. It's bad for America because there's this perception out there that America is a polarized country. People on the right and people on the left, but nobody in the middle. But the truth is, there's a very small percentage of politically active people in America who are polarized, and the vast majority of Americans are actually not polarized at all. But this polarization alienates the vast majority of Americans. Most of them just stay at home because they don't want to be part of the political process. And the fundraising Congress makes this polarization worse because the fundraisers tell the candidates that they should push the message of their fundraising to the extreme. And because the candidates primarily live in safe seats, they can afford to go to the extreme and as they go to the extreme, they increase the alienation that most people feel as they look towards Congress. Congress, the fundraising Congress, bad for America. And then the fundraising Congress is finally bad for democracy. Democracy has got to mean that the winners win. It means that the winners get to change the way that they campaigned for, or if you want to do the Republican version with a little bit of um, Tea Party logo here. You could say even when the Republicans win, they should get what they campaigned for. But this fundraising Congress defeats this. The fundraising Congress supports the status quo Congress, protects the status quo because it is dependent upon the status quo, the status quo funders. The fundraising Congress, bad then for democracy, both for the left and the right. It's bad for the left. Because again, think about the change agenda, the reforms that have been stalled, this extraordinary list of reforms stalled because of the power of money to stall reform. Now, some people look at this and they say, well, what about health care? Didn't Barack Obama change DC because he succeeded in passing health care? For example, Ezra Klein, whose views I usually have enormous respect for, wrote this piece in the Washington Post Describe the twilight of the interest groups. As he put it, the Obama administration succeeded at neutralizing every single industry and in getting health care reform passed. Now, I wish Ezra was right. But my view is closer to the view of Glenn Greenwald. Here's what Glenn Greenwald had to say about Ezra's article. If by neutralizing, Ezra means bribing and accommodating them to such an extreme degree that they ended up affirmatively supporting a bill that lavishes them with massive benefits, then he is absolutely right. But being able to force the government to bribe and accommodate you is not a reflection of your powerlessness, quite the opposite. To pretend that this bill represents the twilight of the interest groups, that special interests have been neutralized, is just hagiography and propaganda. The way this bill has been shaped is the ultimate expression and bolstering of how Washington has long worked. One can find reasonable excuses for why it had to be done that way, but no one can reasonably deny that it was, evoking my favorite modern philosopher, same David Byrne, was. here. Same as this it is ever same, was. same as, as it ever was. was. Same as it ever was. Status quo still stalls this process of making reform because the funders depend upon this status quo. Bad for the left and bad for the right. 
The right is founded by Ronald Reagan and his fear of government spinning out of control. As Ronald Reagan put it, there's a cause for this spinning out of control that's both internal and external. Internal, because as he put it, of bureaucrats. Bureaucrats eagerly grabbing as much power as they can to control the country. And external, because of a very sad story about the way democracy works, as Reagan put it. A democracy cannot exist as a permanent form of government. It can only exist until the voters discover that they can vote themselves largesse out of the public treasury. From that moment on, the majority always votes for the candidate promising the most benefits from the treasury, with the result that democracy always collapses over loose fiscal policy. So in Reagan's world, it's the bureaucrats and the mobs that are going to lead to government growth and ba bankruptcy. Now, in some ways, you could say Reagan was right. He was right about government growth. We've seen an explosion in federal spending. And of course, we've seen an extraordinary explosion relative to median house income, almost eight times as much growth in federal spending relative to median house income. And you could say he's also right about the bankruptcy. We see the extraordinary rise in the federal deficit, a federal deficit that has increased regardless of the leadership in the House and that is projected now to increase to a level never before seen in the history of the United States. Growth and bankruptcy were two predictions he was right about. But was it because of bureaucrats and mobs? Are these really the cause? We consider two stories. First, this is the Communications Act, which now has a total of seven titles. Title II regulates telephones, telecom. Title VI regulates cable. When Al Gore was vice president, he had the idea to take the internet-related components of Title II and Title VI and put them under a new title, Title VII. So DSL and cable would be regulated under Title VII, but it would essentially be deregulated relative to the way it was regulated under Title II and Title VI. His chief legislative staff person took this idea to the Hill. Response from Capitol Hill was, hell no. How are we going to raise money from the telecoms if we deregulate them? So the point is that the scope of regulation is in part affected by the expectation that more regulation will make it easier to raise more money from the people regulated. I think about another example. Congress has this practice that's called tax extenders. The tax code has what's called targeted tax benefits. These are provisions that are written as if they're general provisions, but they turn out to apply to just one or two companies. So it might say, this tax benefit shall go to all companies incorporated on June 4th, 1957 in the town of Providence who happened to have a director who was a graduate of Brown University, so and so, down to one particular company, they get a tax benefit. Now to give a tax benefit under the current rules of pay go, meaning you've got to pay for every benefit with tax revenues, these benefits have to come up for authorization each year. And in this reauthorization, there's a completely predictable political economy. As Rebecca Kaiser describes in the Georgia Law Review, the consequence of this economy has been an explosion in targeted tax benefits. In the 1996 to 2001 period, it was about $22 billion in these benefits. But after the 2003 Act, that number had reached more than $430 billion to uh, continue these benefits forever in their 10th year. Now, why was there that enormous change? The answer is an obvious dynamic. As these tax benefits are about to expire, congressmen see them as huge funding opportunities. They call the people who are benefited by these tax benefits and say, we're going to need your support if we're going to see this benefit extended. And of course, as Kaisar puts it, Legislators acting in their own self-interest by extracting rents and pleasing certain constituents without concern for the social welfare cost of doing so. And you can imagine some young congressperson saying to the tax 
committee, why don't we eliminate these things? They're not doing any good for the economy. And you can imagine the tax committee chairperson responding, hell no. If we eliminate them, how are we going to raise money from the targets that we are benefiting? Well, the point is, in both of these cases, it's the same dynamic, a political economy of government that asks increasingly common question. How does the way I regulate help me raise funds to get back to office? Which means we will have more regulation, more complicated taxes, more senseless monopolies. And so it's no surprise that even though we've had 20 years of conservative presidents in the last 29, we have no smaller government or no simpler taxes. This system is bad for the right as well as for the left. So we have a system, the Fundraising Congress, that's bad for Congress, bad for America, bad for democracy. I think we just say it's bad. Question is, what could we do about it? Well, before answering that, I've got to pay attention to a little bit of quibbles about this claim. Some say, you know, come on, is it really that bad? There are skeptics here. One kind of skeptic, skeptics from academics. So for example, this extraordinarily important paper by Hall and Deerdorf said the lobbyists aren't really there to change people's minds. The lobbyists are there to just subsidize legislative processes by giving more resources to legislators to do what they already want to do. As they put it, the strategy is not to change the legislator's mind, but to assist natural allies in achieving their own coincident objectives. But what does natural allies mean here? Representative Byrne from Virginia described when she first went to Congress, she was told by a senior colleague, whenever you have a question, lean to the green, which wasn't a recommendation to support environmental policies. It was about how you orient yourself to make sure that the lobbyists are on your side when it comes to contributing money. Or a similar paper written uh, recently about why there's so much money and why there's so little money in US politics. The puzzle political scientists have had is really why we don't see a larger amount contributed to candidates. So one example in that paper affects the sugar industry. So there are six major sugar manufacturers in the United States. They have achieved tariffs that allow them to get about $1 billion more in profit every year than they would have if there weren't these tariffs protecting the domestic sugar industry. So they get $1 billion in profits, and they give contributions to candidates running for Congress and for the Senate to support their tariffs. But their contributions are only about $3 million a year. So the puzzle political scientists struggle with is they spend $3 million and they get $1 billion in benefit? You'd think Congress would just hold out a little bit and demand a little bit more in contributions before they give such a big benefit. What explains this difference? And what's explaining this kind of missing money is a fantastic new paper that's just come out called the Iceberg Theory of Campaign Contributions. And the basic argument is, it's the same for me to give you, candidate X, $14,000 as it is for me to give you $4,000 and credibly threaten to give your opponent $10,000. So you are affected by my contribution in the same way if I give you just four and threaten 10 to your opponent as if I gave you $14,000 directly. And this, they suggest, explains the kind of dark matter in political campaigns. A tiny bit is seen at the surface, but most of the effect of campaign contributions is the money that's actually threatened but not given. And it's that threat, they suggest, that explains the vast amount of money or the effect of corporate money in campaigns producing this kind of marionette Congress. Then there's another kind of skeptic, the politician. Politicians who I've talked about here claim that it's ridiculous to suggest that money is affecting results. Maybe it affects access, they say. So former Congressman Mazzoli from Kentucky says people who contribute get the ear of the member and the ear of the staff. They have access and access is it. Access is power. But it doesn't change results. Now I find this pretty hard to believe at least if you want to be charitable 
in interpreting what Congress does. Because there's a whole host of these easy cases, the kind of 2 plus 2 equals 4 cases of government, which government just gets wrong. So I spent many years fighting in the context of copyright. My experience as an activist began on October 27, 1998, when the president signed into law a bill honoring this great American, Sonny Bono, the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act. This was a statute that extended the term of existing copyrights by 20 years. And the question Congress was supposed to be asking was, could it advance the public good to advance an existing copyright by 20 years? Now remember, a copyright is about creating an incentive to produce something new. The one thing we know about incentives is that they're prospective. They're about something that happens in the future. No matter what the United States Congress does, George Gershwin or Robert Frost are not going to create anything new. So when you extend the term in existing copyright, it couldn't be about extending incentives at all. And that's what led this liberal economist, oh wait, this is Milton Friedman, right wing Nobel Prize winning economist, to agree to sign a brief in the Supreme Court claiming there could be no benefit from this extension, but only if the word no-brainer was in the brief somewhere. So clear was it that such a statute could not advance the public good. But apparently there were no brains in this place when they passed the statute. Once again, an easy public policy question Congress just got wrong. Or think about nutrition. There's a consensus among people who know something about the matter that we eat too much of this stuff, not enough of this stuff. 2003, World Health Organization decided they tried to advance public policy on the basis of this consensus. They said that no more than 10% of your daily caloric intake should come from added sugar. Well, the sugar industry uh, went ballistic about this suggestion. They got the United States threat Senate to threaten to withdraw funding from the WHO if the WHO didn't back down from their crazy pro uh, proposal. They wanted the WHO to adopt a standard that said 25% of your daily caloric intake could come from added sugar. Now, the WHO didn't back down, but our government did. 2003, the Food Nutrition Board released standards saying that 25% of your daily caloric intake could come from added sugar. According to our government, this is a balanced diet. You can start with Fruit Loops or M&Ms for breakfast, glass of milk, cheeseburger for lunch, pizza for dinner, three slices of pepperoni pizza, and of course, sugar cookies for dessert. That's a balanced diet, according to our government. Once again, easy public policy question, which the government just gets wrong. Or think about financial services. There's an extraordinary book just came out last week by Johnson and Quack called 13 Bankers. Here's a quick summary of this story. It starts with the, new, the Depression. It turns out the Depression was really bad. <laughs> In response to this really bad depression, Roosevelt, establish a set of principles for regulators. Regulators would follow a simple principle here of oversight where financial instruments were involved. So every major financial instrument during this period, bonds, stocks, and savings, were supervised, or you could say regulated by the government according to certain principles. They had to be public, had to be transparent holdings, and they had to be anti-fraud requirements built into the issuing and holding of those instruments. In the 1990s, there was a new innovation out there called deregulation. Deregulate these new instruments, or the instruments that were being invented at the time, allow them to be privately regulated. So there would be no public requirement, no transparency requirement, and even Alan Greenspan supported that there would be no anti-fraud requirements for people issuing and holding these certificates. Now, at the time, nobody quite realized just how dramatic these new innovations were going to be. So if you look at the percentage of financial instruments that were regulated in 1980, um, Frank Portnoy has estimated 90% of financial instruments were subject to these ordinary New Deal regulations in 1980. But by 2008, the number had reversed. 90% of these financial instruments affecting our economy were unregulated, outside of any regulatory scope, and only 10% were still subject to these ordinary rules of 
regulation. And that, of course, created the incentive to produce the bubble, which burst in 2008 in the way that we've all seen. But that wasn't enough for Wall Street. Deregulation wasn't enough. They also wanted a certain kind of re-regulation. They wanted a government guarantee that when this bubble burst, there would be a government bailout that would back them up and make sure they didn't lose their extraordinary profits. And of course, they got it. The book demonstrates the number of places where they asked for the rules to be changed to guarantee this bailout, and they got the bailout from the very top of the Fed to changes in the ways regulations affected the Fed, producing what Krugman has described again and again, this regime of socialized risk. We all bear the risk, but privatized benefits, the guys who get on average $2.5 billion in annual returns from their trading, getting the benefit from the system. Now, from a public policy perspective, this is insanely stupid. So why did our government do it? Well, we can't really know deep down, but on the surface, we do know this. Campaign contributions from these sectors grew fastest than over any other sector in the economy during the period under, during which Congress relaxed these regulations. Once again, this easy public policy question which Congress just gets wrong. Or one final example, global warming. There's a consensus, or there was until there was a snowstorm in Washington this year, <laughs> uh, that we're doing it. As Gore puts it, the debate's over. There are five points in the consensus. Number one, global warming is real. Number two, we human beings are mainly responsible. Number three, consequences are very bad. Number four, we need to fix it quickly. And number five, it's not too late. Someone decided they wanted to test the consensus. So they did a random sample of 1,000 peer-reviewed articles published between 1993 and 2003. They found 0%, exactly zero of those articles questioned this basic consensus. Then someone did a comparable study of popular media articles between 1988 and 2002. They found that 53% of those popular media articles questioned the basic consensus. And the difference between the peer-reviewed and popular articles was the product of the enormous amount of junk science that has been spread into this space by corporate funding around this issue, giving politicians the excuse they need to delay doing anything about arguably the most important public policy question facing the globe for at least 10 years, an easy public policy question which Congress just gets wrong. Now, the point is, in all of these cases, either Congress gets these things wrong because Congress is a bunch of idiots or because Congress is guided by something other than reason. And my own view, I know this is very controversial, but my own view is Congress is not a bunch of idiots. This is not a problem explained by stupidity. It's explained by a set of incentives that make it so they can't even do what is the most obvious right thing to do. And it's not just easy cases. Everywhere. Policy is increasingly bent to those who pay, and public trust is then weakened. So Congress is an institution where the vast majority believe money buys results. A poll just released this week from North Carolina found 80% of people believe money buys results, leading to a public view of Congress that has its confidence at the lowest level in American history. There are arguably more people who believed in the British crown at the time of re the revolution than believe in our Congress today, leading to enormous cynicism about how the system functions. So the green middle America increasingly disappears from political activity because of this cynicism, leaving the proverbial fox guarding the hen house. Now, this is bad. But it's about to get much, much worse. You might have heard of this institution. It's called the United States Supreme Court. They decided this case one year and a day after Barack Obama was sworn into office called Citizens United versus the FEC. Based on the freedom of speech clause in the Constitution, they held that corporations have an unlimited right to independent campaign expenditures to using corporate funds at any time prior to an election. Now, we have to set this decision in some context. So if you look at the total amount of money raised and spent in 2008 to elect members to Congress, both the House and the Senate, that was about $1.4 billion. Of that $1.4 billion, less than 10% was contributed in contributions of $200 or less. 
Last year, there was about $3.47 billion spent by lobbyists lobbying Congress. Of that $3.47 billion, less than 1.2% was spent by organized labor lobbying Congress. One statistic captures this perfectly. Organized labor, AFL-CIO has four lobbyists on Capitol Hill right now. In the banking bill regulations, there are four lobbyists per member of Congress now being funded by the banking industry. So a tiny percentage of this comes from organized labor. The vast majority of this money is coming from the richest and most powerful corporations in America. Now, those numbers might like big, but just think through what Citizens United might bring into this political marketplace. So if you take 1% of the corporate profits of the Fortune 400 in 2008, and you imagine that just 1% of their profits now gets devoted to political independent campaign expenditures because of the freedom given to them by Citizens United. That number would be $6.2 billion. It's off the chart, literally, off the chart. It is more than the total amount raised and spent in 2008 plus the total amount of lobbying that now would be available to affect the way Congress makes its choices. Now, the Supreme Court looks at that and say, there's no problem. This information can be disclosed. Congress can require that expenditures be disclosed. So if Exxon comes into a district and spends $10 million against a candidate who supports global warming legislation, the voters will know that, and the voters can adjust on the basis of that disclosure. But what the Supreme Court doesn't do, apparently, is read the coolest political science articles. Because, of course, the point is the money is not disclosed if it is a threat. And in a world where the spending can be unlimited, the power of that threat is now vastly greater than it was in the old days when they still couldn't explain why there was so little money in politics. Taking this problem of the marionette Congress and raising it to you pick the end power, making it much, much worse. Okay, so here's some summary, right? Number one, the independence of our Congress has been corrupted, not by foreign princes, but by domestic princes. Number two, this corruption is bad for Congress, bad for democracy, bad for America. So what do we do about it? Well, I think there's inspiration from this case. If this case was Citizens United, then what we need to find in response to this case is a way to unite citizens, right? And we unite citizens to do something very familiar to many people, more familiar to the Windows users than the Mac or the Linux users, but we need to reboot the democracy, right? Here's the Mac. Here's Ubuntu. The coolest of all, of course. The point is reboot, right? So what is rebooting? Control, alt, delete in that one universe. So what does control, alt, delete here mean? Well, first it means we need to take control. Who needs to take control? Well, citizens, right? We need this movement. I think the movement should have three principles. Number one, it should be a citizen's movement. The point is not to criticize politicians. Politicians are important and valuable, and many of them are on, are on our side, and we need politicians on our side. But this movement has got to be primarily led by citizens, people who are not looking for a job in Congress, people who are trying to change the way the Congress works so it does its job. So number one is citizens' movement. Number two, it's got to be cross-partisan. We've got to have room for the Tea Party, for the Coffee Party, for the Green Tea Party, for the Instant Coffee Party. All of these different organizations need to feel that there is a common objective here. Because even though these organizations don't share common goals, we should be able to get them to see that there is a common enemy in the way the system doesn't function. And number three, this needs to be a movement designed to restore integrity to the system that our framers gave us. So what would the changes have to be to achieve those three objectives? Well, this is where we focus on the delete. We need to delete the corrupting influence of money in this system. An idea given to us by a Republican 102 years ago 
change the way money corrupts the system by invoking a system of citizen-funded elections. And the current versions of this imagine a voluntary opt-in system where candidates receive small dollar contributions only. So for example, a bill in the House right now, the Larson-Jones bill, Fair Elections Now Act, would say that you could receive up to $100 from any citizen. The government will match it four to one, so that's worth $500 to you. That bill now has 142 co-sponsors in the House. Or another idea proposed by professors Ackerman and Ayers would be basically a $50 democracy voucher every single citizen would get that they then could complement with a $100 contribution of their own regular money for every, any citizen. The nice thing about the $50 is that for every voter, that would produce about $6 billion of money in the system. Remember, in 2008, the total amount raised and spent was just $1.4 billion. Now, either way, under either of these two systems, the objective is to make the system so that nobody could believe money was buying results so that we all could believe as we want to believe that whatever the excuse was for Congress doing whatever stupid thing that Congress did, it was either because there are too many Republicans or too many Democrats, but it was not because of the money, and so that we could end the way this marionette Congress functions. So how is it we could bring about these citizen fund elections? What are the strategies? Well, we have to distinguish between inside the Beltway strategies and outside the Beltway strategies. Inside the Beltway strategies are about how to get a certain bit of legislation passed. So the organization that I helped found with Joe Trippi, um, which now includes a wide range of uh, board members, including Mark McKinnon, who was John McCain's campaign manager and worked also for Bush 43, is this organization Change Congress which has launched this site, Fix Congress First, that organizes people to take action to get more supporters on this bill. So you can go and put in your zip code and discover whether your representatives are on the bill, and then you're given a script to call them and to ask them kindly to join the bill. And if they've already joined the bill, you can thank them for it. That's one step we're doing. A second thing we're doing, inspired by Citizens United, is to push a kind of Funders United project. Right? So this is a funders pledge. The pledge of funders to campaigns is that they will give no more money to political campaigns, to politicians, unless the politician has irrevocably committed to supporting citizen-funded elections. I originally wanted to use Nancy Reagan's Just Say No slogan. I found out it was trademarked, so I couldn't use it. So <laughs> we kind of we have to update it, like just text no or just tweet no. But the point is, this is a way of getting funders to unite for the purpose of supporting these citizen-funded elections. And I'm extraordinarily proud to announce that we will be releasing a letter signed by Arnold Hyatt and Alan Hassenfeld um, in two weeks, asking the top contributors to the Democratic Party to join him in this pledge not to give to any candidate who doesn't support citizen-funded elections. And I think Mr. Hassenfeld is here, so he deserves a round of applause for this. Now, you can still look at this and say, is this enough? Will a conventional battle here be enough? Are people like this, the likes of Gerald Cassidy, going to just walk away from all the money in the world, which is what these reforms would do. It would destroy their industry. It wouldn't eliminate lobbying. We need lobbying but it would change dramatically the value of their industry and it would make it much more difficult for certain businesses to use their power in Washington. And increasingly I worry that they're not going to simply walk away from this money, that the conventional inside the Beltway strategy is not going to be enough. So we need to think of outside the Beltway strategies. And this is where the final component of the reboot democracy comes in, the alt part. There are two laws of politics we have to keep in mind. Number one, America always needs a horse race to focus on any political question. It is a rare event indeed when a bunch of Brown students would come out on a Friday night to listen to a talk of, about politics. I can tell you, you're very weird. Most parts of the world, this would be an impossible 
idea because there's no horse race here. There's no candidate. There's no imminent election. There is no potential victory. There are no jobs at the other end of the fight. So that's number one. It needs a horse race. And number two, what we know from all sorts of struggles is the rebels using conventional means never can win. So we knew we had to fight the redcoats in the revolution, not by donning redcoats and standing up against them and fighting them in the same way. We had to adopt different strategies. Everybody knew you couldn't build another Death Star to, build the, to kill the Death Star. You were going to have to use different strategies. And Obama only got elected because he had the internet, which would give a radically new way to raise money that would allow him to bypass the traditional filters that would guarantee that somebody like a first-term senator from Illinois could not begin to run for president because the funders would never permit it. We need these unconventional horse race here, too. We need to find a way to create such an unconventional horse race to make this kind of regime reform possible. And it turns out the framers gave us that possibility. Article 5, which affects how the Constitution gets amended, has two standard ways to amend the Constitution. One is that Congress proposes the amendment, and then the states ratify it. The second is that the states call on Congress to call a convention, a convention for the purpose of proposing amendments, which then go back to the states for the purpose of ratifying them. If 34 states called a convention, then Congress would be required to call that convention and form it. So 34 states, what might that look like? Well, we could start with this tiny little state. You can barely see it, but there it is. Rhode Island is the first, of course, and then there'd be other states that would follow instantly once Rhode Island did it. I mean, this would be trendsetter around the nation. But the point here to recognize about the politics is that you can call for a convention for any purpose, and so long as there are just 34 different purposes articulated by 34 states, that's enough to force Congress to call the convention. Now, you might look at this and say, is this a little bit too terrifying? Because the convention, many people fear, can run away. They can propose all sorts of changes that we don't actually want the Constitution to suffer. But we need to remember a couple important points about how this process works. First, whatever comes out of the convention must be ratified. And it's ratified by legislatures or state conventions. It's not ratified by referenda. So the insanity evinced in California every election by a referendum to do the dumbest things possible is not what we'd have to fear here because it's not the referenda, it's legislatures that do something. And second, it's 38 legislatures that are required to enact any such proposal, which means that 12 states can block it. And if you think there are easily 12 red and 12 blue states in our country and will always be, there's no chance that either side need fear. The other side will radically change the way democracy works. And finally, we have to remember or recognize um, even without any push from our side, this is already having an effect here. Because even if we don't get to 34 states, as the number of states calling for a convention increase, it has an effect on how Congress thinks about its job. As they imagine the possibility of losing control, they will respond. Indeed, they will respond with exactly the reform that will stop this convention call from proceeding. And there's an important precedent in this. The only time in the history of the United States when Congress changed its structure was the 17th Amendment. The 17th Amendment, which made it so senators were elected rather than appointed by the states. The 17th Amendment was proposed by Congress after there was all but one state necessary to call a convention because Congress was so fearful of a convention that they were going to short circuit it through this reform. And that's the point. The fear of a convention can induce the change necessary, and we should recognize that that potential exists today. And we should also recognize one other important fact. It's already starting independent of the movement to push for citizen-funded elections. The far right has already started pushing for a convention. The Wall Street Journal had this op-ed last week. 
um, which was calling for a convention to rein in Washington's power. And those of us who believe that reform is necessary to at least make it possible for democracy to work need to be part of this debate so that we can help define this as part of the movement too. So Ch Change Congress has also launched this site, callaconvention.org, which we will be um, releasing to the public this uh, next week. It has both a platform for organizing people to support state legislators who are pushing for a convention and a platform for debating different ideas to amend the Constitution and ranking them and criticizing them as people want. But it is really important to find the first state. And I can't think of a better first state <laughs> than this one. This state should be first, not only because it has some of the coolest people in the country, especially a place like Brown, no doubt, but it was also the last to ratify the Constitution. So I figure if you were the last to ratify the Constitution, you should be the first to restore the Constitution to the system that you last ratified. You should be the first, and you should lead the rest of the country in this effort to Okay, one final thought here before I stop. So everybody knows this company, Stride Right, at least because of their product, Keds. Stride Right was started by a man named Arnold Hyatt. He's a shy man. There's only one picture on the internet of Arnold Hyatt, and it's so tiny you can't explode, you can't make it very big. Um, but here he is. He is a loyal Democrat. 1996, he was the second largest contributor to the Democratic Party in the United States. And then President Bill Clinton invited 30 of the largest contributors to come to the White House and tell him a little bit about how to do his job. So basically, it was a dinner for fat cats. Now, we don't have any pictures from that event, but I kind of figure that uh, when everybody got up to speak, and it came time for Arnold to stand up and speak. It looked a little bit like this. Arnold stood up and spoke to the president. And he told the president a certain story. He said, Mr. President, I know you're a big admirer of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He said, I want you to put, you, you put yourself in Roosevelt's mind as 1939. Before the United States had entered World War II, and Roosevelt recognized he needed to convince a reluctant nation to wage a war to save democracy. And Hyatt said to President Clinton, you too need to convince a reluctant nation to wage a war to save democracy. Not a war against fascists, but a war against fat cats, like everybody in that room. A war against the people who would use their money to control the way government regulated. Well, he finished his little intervention. There was silence in the room. Afterwards, he wrote up in a memo his feeling. He said, I came away from the evening with empathy for a skunk at a lawn party. It's described in this book, the only published account of the event. Clinton's response to Hyatt effectively slashed Hyatt to pieces humiliating him in front of the group. Basically, we didn't come to power to give up power unilaterally. But I think that 14 years later, it's finally time for us to recognize that Arnold Hyatt was right. We have to convince a reluctant nation to wage a war to save democracy, to wage a war, to take up arms. Sarah Palin has told us we can use this rhetoric without anybody being confused about whether we're talking about real guns. OK, we're going to use this rhetoric. We're not talking about guns. We're talking about democracy, making democracy work to save this democracy. And at least with this war, we can say, unlike others, that it's necessary. It is a necessary war to save this democracy. So join us in this war and lead us in this battle to find a way to restore the democracy our framers gave us. Thank you very much.